Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this 26th, I think, annual uh, legislative luncheon hosted by our friends here at Bridgewater State University in cooperation with our friends at Massasoit. So let's have a round of applause for them. With almost 11,000 undergraduate and graduate students, Bridgewater State University is a force, not just here in the region, but in the Commonwealth. Uh, virtually all of the public school teachers uh, come through here at one point or another, and I know, speaking from our town, uh, at least 90% have either an undergrad or graduate degree from Bridgewater, so imagine what we would be without a Bridgewater State. If you also look at the economic impact in terms of the payroll and the build out and everything here, it's just a tremendous resource to have in this region. We're so fortunate to be here. Not to mention the beautiful 270 acres uh, that are right here in the center of Bridgewater. Uh, we're very, very appreciative of having uh, the ability to be here today. At this time, I would ask uh, you to please rise as we welcome Colleen McDonough, a student at Bridgewater State University, to sing our national anthem. Colleen. Well done, Colleen. Well done. Thank you. Today is March 20th, uh, one day before another Nor'easter, but I won't get into that. Uh, it's also World Social Work Day. Uh, every day, the nation's 650,000 social workers help make our society a better place to live. One of our chamber members, the Old Colony Elder Services, are also called OCES, is proud of the contributions of social workers and their staff who work together to support strong families and communities throughout the region. So today, on World Social Work Day, we are pleased to announce that OCES will make a $1,000 scholarship contribution to a student here at Bridgewater State University. We, we won't, this student is likely, as many of our teachers, uh, more than 80% uh, that graduate from here stay in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so uh, it's a great investment and we appreciate uh, both Susan Willis and Fred Clark uh, for their uh, partnership in providing the scholarship and administering it. I also want to note some sad news. Uh, today is the last day for Athena Lavoie. She has accepted a position at Butler Hospital in Providence, closer to her home. Athena is responsible for this event and many of the events you've enjoyed the last three and a half, four years. So a round of applause for Athena. You may have recognized a couple of people at the registration as new. Uh, we have uh, Kelly Thompson Clark, who's now uh, Senior VP with the Chamber of Commerce. She ran the Cambridge Chamber for a number of years and is a Canton resident. We also have Emma Stratton, who's now our communications and newsletter website coordinator, communications overall, and uh, Dor Doris uh, Facia, who's uh, also uh, uh, with the Chamber and a long-term uh, volunteer uh, with us. So a round of applause for all of them. 
We are honored today to have as our guest speaker, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Robert DeLeo. Please give him a nice warm round of applause. In addition, we're going to hear from the Honorable Mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter. A round of applause for Mayor. In addition, we have many elected and selected officials uh, in attendance. Our participation, their participation in this program offers a great opportunity for them to see firsthand business people and hear from them in terms of their concerns, but also to hear uh, from the mayor of Brockton, our capital city in this region, and uh, the Speaker of the House. I would like to recognize the elected officials who are here today. As I call your name, please give a wave, and uh, we'll hold our applause until the very end. We have with us uh, Senator, State Senator Michael Brady, we also have State Representative Claire Cronin, State Representative Tom Coulter, State Representative Michelle Dubois, State Representative Jerry Cassidy. We also have with us a City Councilor uh, from Brockton, Ann Beauregard, and City Councilor Susan Nicastro. We also have with us the Superintendent of Schools from Brockton, Kathy Smith. In addition, we have the Chairman of the Southeast and Very General Vocational High School, Mark Lindy. Uh, from the Town of Bridgewater, we have Vice President, Councilor at Large, Edward Haley. Councilor Sean George, Police Chief Christopher Delmonte. Uh, from Whitman, we have Town Administrator Frank Lynham, Assistant Town Administrator Lisa Green, Selectman Scott Lambiosi, uh, Lambesi, uh, Selectman Randy Lamatina. Uh, from the Town of Halifax, Town Administrator Charlie Seelig, Chairman Troy Garron, and Selectman Thomas Milius. From the Town of Easton, we have Selectman Craig Barger, and Town of Canton, we have Selectman Mark Porter. From the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, we have Dick Dalton. Let's have a round of applause for our elected and selected officials. <laughs> I would now like to draw your attention to the green forms on your table. The Speaker of the House has agreed to accept some questions at the end. He will be asked questions by Ray Ledoux, the Chair of our Government Affairs Division. Uh, please jot down your question and hold them up. A Chamber staff person will be around and will uh, ask them in the order in which uh, they're available. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce our immediate past chair of the board, Sue Joss, president of the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, as our MC. Sue. Thanks, Chris, and um, welcome to everyone. And in addition to having a blizzard coming tomorrow um, and being Social Work Day, um, this is also the first day of spring, I think, within this hour. So let's celebrate spring and not worry about the blizzard. Um, so the, the Chamber is proud to report important regional activity over the past year. We have once again been designated as a Regional Economic Development Organization, or REDO. Through REDO, we have created a business retention and expansion program and have assisted more than 70 businesses whose impact represent a total regional investment of more than $150 million. We have conducted tours with the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, highlighting regional business assets and industry leaders. We have advocated for lower commercial tax rates in several communities and have, have hosted important um, legislative speaker speakers, such as Governor Charlie Baker, Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Jay Ash, Secretary of Transportation, Stephanie Pollack, and of course, Speaker DeLeo today. We have also completed several studies, one on the creation of a regional, regional water sewer authority, another on the best uses for underutilized properties such as the CXS rail yard and the Brockton Fairgrounds, and more recently, we released an analysis of proposal to purchase the Aquaria desalinization plant. All this work was made possible through the state's designation of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce as a REDO, or Regional Economic Development Organization. Our goals for the REDO for the upcoming year include a study on pre-permitting of land for biotech and life science businesses, a community partnership initiative to promote economic development, and a multicultural program that strengthens diversity and workforce throughout the program, throughout the region. So to kick off our program, I'd like to um, welcome and bring up the two sponsors um, of today's event, which is Bridgewater State University, Fred Clark, President, and Bill Mitchell from Massasoit, Massasoit Community College. Uh, Fred and Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sue. I, I apologize, I have a little laryngitis, I'll work through it. Uh, when I woke up and I had this voice, my wife said she's sorry for me, but she hopes it will last. <laughs> um, 
On behalf of our 11,000 students here at Bridgewater and our entire campus community, we're very proud to welcome all of you to Bridgewater State and to host, once again, the Metro South Chamber's annual legislative luncheon. We want to recognize and uh, welcome back to Bridgewater Speaker DeLeo, all of our state senators and state representatives in the room, our friend Mayor Bill Carpenter, as well as other honored guests in the room. Mr. Speaker, you already know this, but in southeastern Massachusetts, we have an incredibly effective and hardworking legislative delegation. They put people first, and they work together across party lines to solve problems for this region. And we're sincerely grateful here at Bridgewater in this, and in this region for their service. And one of those members who represents this campus, Representative D'Amelia, who's called me four times to make sure that I convey this, is at a um, uh, Ways and Means hearing up, and I think in Everett, and he sends you his best, and I hope he's going to send me and Bill. Oh, okay, all right. He's covered all the bases very well. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge my good friend here, uh, President Bill Mitchell at Massasoit, our co-sponsor today. He is a terrific colleague. I love working with him. And he's also a Bridgewater graduate, and he's a Bridgewater parent. He has other children, so Bill, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Um, I just had a couple of comments. I wanted you to know Bridgewater is, um, according to Boston Business Journal, the 10th largest university, public or private, in Massachusetts. Uh, we graduate over 2,500 students per year. Uh, we're top 10 in the United States of America for our undergraduate research program, and also, and probably more importantly, uh, for closing achievement gaps while raising the graduation rate for all students. Now, all of us in this room have something to be proud of in terms of our individual impact in this region. Bridgewater's impact is actually in the middle of your tables all around the room, just examples of it. But I want to just have a couple of comments about something more important, and that is partnership, the word partnership. Because ultimately, the challenges we face in southeastern Massachusetts requires us to form stronger partnerships with everyone in this room to advance the common good. No one of us can do it alone. We know that. And at Bridgewater, we've uh, expanded our partnerships with the private sector. It's critically important in this region. Massachusetts and this region is already facing a historic talent shortage uh, of college-educated workers that are needed to fill current jobs. The problem is going to get worse from today all the way out to 2035. That's as far as they can see. Because baby boomers, like Bill and I, are going to be retiring at continuing uh, rates. Not me or Bill, but the rest of those baby boomers. Um, and there are just fewer students in the pipeline that will graduate from high school to take our place. That's the essence of the talent shortage. We have to work together to address that problem. And at Bridgewater, one of the workforce initiatives we've deployed um, to, is to expand our connections for students to get jobs after graduation uh, in the workforce through paid internships, paid internships. Our goal here is to develop 1,000 paid internships. We started five years ago with 12. Today we're at 450. And I want to give you, Mr. Speaker, the credit for that, along with your colleagues in the legislature. This is a House of Representatives initiative. Uh, the dollars for paid internships have always been in the House bill and for the past seven years. Those dollars are given to the state universities and we have to match them with private philanthropy. At Bridgewater, over the course of those sev seven years, it's, it's been almost $850,000. We've raised a million dollars to match those dollars. And today, those 450 internships are overcoming transportation barriers, uh, financial barriers. They are making a difference for our students and for the employers in this region. And Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all the students that have participated, not just here at Bridgewater, but across the state. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the, the last thing I'll mention is uh, partnership also has to be within public higher education. I have a great partner here in Massasoit, and also at Bristol Community College and Cape Cod Community College. Public higher ed knows how to work together to, to uh, address the needs of our students. We collectively, about 95% of all of our students are Massachusetts residents. We know how to work together. I was going to talk about that partnership, but I want to have uh, Bill Mitchell talk about it. It's a partnership we're very, very proud of. We call it MCC to BSU, and I know that there are hundreds of students in the pipeline, and with that, my colleague, Bill Mitchell.
Thank you, Mr. President. There's not much more to say after that wonderful speech. But I do want to say, and Fred did mention I'm an alum of Bridgewater, very proud alum. And my daughter is a sophomore here, and uh, she's probably roaming around campus right now, I'm sure. But the last time, not maybe a couple of times ago, the last time I was in this room, I was registering for classes. And you had those cards, and you waited in line. And I'm the lines went just like this. So I came back, and very fond memories. You still, you don't do it that way still. No, no, we, we, have, we have computers. So we at Massasoit, and I'll get to our partnership in a second, we're very excited about a couple of programs that we have uh, recently unveiled. We have a veterinary techno uh, technician program in our Canton campus. Our first graduating class, 100% placement in the workforce with 40 to $55,000 a year jobs. Very proud of that. We also have a paramedic program at our Canton campus. I went to the first pinning ceremony, and I said, asked the director, where were all the students? were supposed to be here upon graduation. They were out working. They were being hired before they finished by fire departments and ambulances, uh, companies around southeastern Massachusetts. We also have just opened up a brand new engineering lab and had the people from UMass come down to see it. And I think they're going to be making a request for updated facilities after seeing ours. But we do have uh, programs with UMass Dartmouth and UMass Lowell for our graduates to go to. Fred said that uh, we have a great partnership. We really have a great partnership, and it starts with this gentleman right to my right. Fred mentioned the MCC to BSU program, a wonderful program that allows our students to move seamlessly from Massasoit to BSU. Now, some of you would say, well, haven't you already been doing that? Yes, many of our graduates do go on to Bridgewater. But President Clark has invested in it. He has put a counselor on the campus of Massasoit Community College, a Bridgewater State employee, to help our students uh, with that program. And they have also are looking to change their letters when students maybe don't meet the grades, the academic requirements to come to Bridgewater. They don't get rejected. They get invited to attend this new collaborative in which they will be accepted into a program, perhaps given a Bridgewater State ID, access to all of the facilities here at Bridgewater State, yet they need some help and they come to us and we get them ready to, to transfer over to a great school and a great partner of Bridgewater State University. So it's just another way. It's another way to help our students figure out their path and move them along. And I'm eternally grateful for giving our students that opportunity, Mr. President. So very excited. I am the interim president. I think it said in the, in the bullet time was the acting president, interim president. There's a lot of people working very hard to get rid of me, the search committee that's moving along. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting position to be in. Um, but uh, that should uh, wrap up fairly shortly. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back at my alma mater. And it's a pleasure to stand uh, with my friend Fred Clark. Mr. Speaker, I have to just say that uh, we're eternally grateful for the STEM program. At Massasoit, it's meant a lot to hundreds of students, hundreds of students at a community college who have had a research experience. It was unheard of several years ago for community college kids to have research experience. And you may recall that you came down to Massasoit and you watched their presentations and they were studying bees and the impact in bees on the environment. And it really is incredible to watch these students and what they produce. And you walked away with a little something from Massasoit that I think you still have in your office. We actually gave you a bee. <laughs> so you still have our bee. If you don't, I'll send you another bee, <laughs> just to remind you. But I want to thank you. And I also want to thank, again, being the interim. I'm a Brockton kid. The local delegation has been phenomenal in supporting me in Massasoit. And the mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter, has been phenomenally uh, as well in, in, in supporting me and Massasoit. And as I say all the time, um, it's the best job in the world, being president of Massasoit. And I'll tell you why. Because I was a student at Massasoit. That's where I started. I got my first exposure to public higher education from the institution that I now lead and that I'm a, par a part of. So it's really wonderful to be here at my alma mater, but also um, being able to lead the institution from which got me on the right path after the first semester. The first semester didn't go too well. 
but that's okay. I think I'm straightened out by now. And I know, Fred, I mean, you, you're an alum of Bridgewater State as well. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for listening for a few minutes and uh, look forward to seeing some of you after the, after the meal. Thank you. Thanks, Bill and Fred. That was a great overview. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter. Bill Carpenter is a 30-year resident of Brockton and prior to being elected mayor, served for four years as the Ward 5 representative to the Brockton School Committee. Bill Carpenter has served as mayor of Brockton for over four years now and is currently in his third term. Among his many accomplishments, his administration has established a new economic development team, increased investment in public safety, created new sources of revenue, updated the city's use of technology, and has spread diversity on city boards and commissions. His administration has made substantial revitalization efforts that are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for both businesses and residents throughout the city. Mayor Carpenter has received national recognition for his efforts to address the opioid crisis. He is the co-founder of Independence Academy, the state's fourth recovery school, and, is in, his, and in his second term, he launched the Champion Plan, a police-assisted recovery program that has helped hundreds of individuals suffering from addiction to access treatment. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Bill Carpenter. Thank you, Sue. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I had the opportunity four years ago to share this program with the speaker, and Mr. Speaker, it's a privilege to share the uh, program with you once again today. I'd like to thank Chris Cooney and the members of the chamber for the invitation uh, to join you today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've got to tell you, I know you've had a very long and distinguished career. I think that one of the best decisions you've ever made was the day that you selected Representative Cronin to become the first woman chair of the Judiciary Committee. And I really do mean that. Uh, I, President Clark and President Mitchell, I, I can't say how much the Massasoit to Bridgewater connection means uh, to students from a city like Brockton. And uh, I recall about three years ago, uh, this university, with uh, uh, Dr. Molafaria retiring, uh, went on a great wide national search to come to the conclusion that the next best leader of the university was here the whole time. And they made a great decision when they chose Fred Clark. And now as I watch Massasoit Community College going through the same exercise, uh, I hope that they'll come to the realization that the next best leader of Massasoit Community College is already sitting in the seat, Bill Mitchell. So I was asked to give you a regional update, and I'll attempt to do that. Uh, the city of Brockton's come a long way over the past four years. Uh, Brockton is experiencing record new growth. We're revitalizing our downtown, we're diversifying our workforce, and we're making our neighborhoods safer and cleaner. With police staffing now at its highest level in 30 years, violent crime is down, and the Brockton PD continues to aggressively pursue drug dealers in our neighborhoods. So far this year, Brockton police have already executed 17 search warrants, seizing drugs and making arrests. And many of these warrants were the results of joint investigations with our partners in the Massachusetts State Police, along with federal law enforcement agencies. For the first time, we're engaged in real long-term planning for the future of our city. From our downtown action strategy, to Brockton 2025, our economic development plan, to the blueprint for Brockton, our new master plan for the city. And we've taken on the challenges that most directly impact Brockton residents. We created the opioid task force that led to the champion plan, and the task force on housing and neighborhood stabilization. We've created a quality of life task force of city agencies that meets weekly, targeting problem properties throughout the city. We've earned green community status, securing a half million dollar grant in the process, and are close to completing the installation and replacement of 9,000 streetlights across the city with LEDs. 
We're restoring parks and playgrounds across the city, and we're investing in technology to improve constituent services and to operate government more efficiently. But perhaps the biggest challenge facing gateway cities like Brockton is the underfunding of our public schools by the state. The Chapter 70 Local Aid to Education formula is broken. This is not just my opinion, but this were the findings of the Foundation Budget Review Commission established by the legislature in its final report in October of 2015. The commission found that the Chapter 70 reimbursement is inadequate for special education, inadequate for English language learners, and inadequate for low-income students. And that sounds like a pretty good description of the Brockton Public Schools. Last year, DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, forced a for-profit charter school into Brockton that we did not want, and now deducts millions of dollars from our Chapter, 7 of funding, Chapter 70 funding to pay for it. In the governor's proposed FY19 budget, Brockton will lose an additional $3 million to charter schools, resulting in a total net loss to the Brockton schools of nearly $12 million of our education funding. Just this past Sunday, the Boston Globe highlighted the spending disparities between Brockton and more affluent school districts. The statewide average cost per pupil for textbooks and software is $67. Brockton only spends $10.66 per pupil, one-sixth of the statewide average. The statewide average per pupil cost for classroom supplies is $76.52, while Brockton is only able to spend $1.28. Meanwhile, an affluent community like Weston spends $275 per student. And perhaps the most frightening gap is our lack of funding for classroom technology. The statewide average per pupil cost for classroom technology is $61.28, compared to Brockton, where only $3.43 per student is spent on technology. And by the way, in Weston, they're able to spend $210 per student. How are Brockton kids supposed to compete in the 21st century without access to technology? So, Mr. Speaker, the, the children growing up in cities like Brockton need your help. While ability and potential may be equally distributed, opportunity is not, and we need to change that. And the state has a constitutional obligation to our school children, according to the Supreme Court. However, we simply cannot afford to wait for changes. We will make the tough budget cuts, we will live within our means, and we will seek alternative sources of revenue. Right now, there is an opportunity for cities like Brockton to reap millions of dollars of tax revenue by permitting the cultivation and sale of adult recreational marijuana. Earlier today, with the sponsorship of Councilor Monaghan, we filed legislation with the Brockton City Council to authorize and regulate both the cultivation and retail sales of adult recreational marijuana in the city of Brockton. We look forward to working with the City Council to create zoning ordinances that will allow us to take advantage of this opportunity while still protecting the quality of life in our city. Our proposal would limit retail sales to within the downtown 40-hour smart growth business district. Retail sales would not be allowed on the first floor. They would be restricted to the second floor or higher, minimizing the visibility and impact to our downtown business district. Hours of operation would be limited to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And per the new state regulations, shops will not be allowed to locate within 500 feet of a K through 12 school. In addition to the tax revenues, this will be a real economic development benefit to the ongoing revitalization of our downtown. We will see an immediate demand for second and third floor space downtown in underutilized properties incentivizing the development and redevelopment of downtown buildings. After decades of watching people drive through downtown Brockton, we will now see people with disposable income driving to downtown Brockton, parking their cars, and getting out to spend money. 
Outside of the downtown business district, this proposal would permit cultivation and manufacturing of adult recreational marijuana in industrial zones only. We believe that cultivation and manufacturing within industrial zones is consistent with the existing use of those properties and will have no negative impacts on the surrounding areas. Brockton is uniquely positioned to benefit from the investment of tens of millions of dollars in this new industry, particularly in light of the decision of several surrounding communities to ban recreational sales. I believe that working with the City Council and allowing for public input, we can thoughtfully and properly implement the state's new marijuana regulations so that the city can reap potentially millions of dollars of tax revenue while still protecting the quality of life of our residents. Brockton has been the home to a medical marijuana cultivation and sales dispensary for two and a half years now. We've gained valuable experience and the surrounding neighborhood has suffered no negative impacts. Both our police chief and fire chief report no public safety concerns and in fact, most people driving by do not even realize the dispensary is there. Faced with the prospects of ongoing annual multi-million dollar budget deficits, it would be irresponsible not to seek the revenues that can be produced for the city through adult recreational marijuana sales. The revenue generated to the city from adult recreational marijuana sales will provide for teachers in our classrooms and police and fire protection on the streets of our city. I cannot justify laying off one more school teacher while leaving millions of dollars on the table. We simply cannot afford to miss this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Carpenter. I'd like to take this time to bring up State Representative Claire Cronin. Representative Cronin was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives for the 11th Plymouth District, which includes Brockton and Easton, on November 5, 2012. Representative Cronin is an active supporter of the Chamber of, Chamber's events and initiatives, and we're happy to have you here today to introduce the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, Robert DeLeo. Please help me welcome Claire Cronin. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker. Welcome to Bridgewater State University. Uh, I'd like to introduce the speaker. A lot of you probably don't know all about his background. You hear about him in the paper, but you don't know who he is or what he has done. So I'm going to try to give you a little taste of that. House Speaker Robert DeLeo has represented the town of Winthrop and a portion of the city of Revere in the Massachusetts House of Representatives since 1991. In 2016, Speaker DeLeo prior prioritized legislation to help the Commonwealth meet its clean energy goals and upgrade the region's energy infrastructure, ultimately resulting in a landmark law which will diversify Massachusetts energy portfolio and ensure a reliable electric grid by replacing older power sources that are due to retire. These measures will protect the Commonwealth's ratepayers while enhancing renewable energy and securing a more sustainable future. In 2014, Speaker DeLeo led the legislature in passing a consensus-driven gun safety law that closes existing loopholes, creates a sustainable framework to stop gun trafficking, and establishes best practices for school safety. We were first on that one, folks. <laughs> Speaker DeLeo has spearheaded two economic development packages which focus on improving the Massachusetts economy through comprehensive strategies. A 2014 Boston Globe article praised Speaker DeLeo as one of the biggest champions of our innovation economy and described him as knowledgeable and fluent in getting things done 
and what the innova innovation economy needs. Under his leadership, the House of Representatives has made strides in helping to combat the current substance abuse addiction epidemic. The legislature has passed two medically comprehensive substance addiction bills and increased funding for this public health crisis to unprecedented levels. Speaker DeLeo's priorities continue to include job creation, strong fiscal management, and giving residents a competitive edge through educational opportunities. So please join me in welcoming all around good guy, the Speaker of the House, Mr. Robert DeLeo. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you for that very kind introduction. Now you know why I appointed her as a chair. Um, and I'd have to say, um, and thank you for hosting us here today, President Clark, President Mitchell, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here uh, today. And it's an absolute pleasure to join you in Bridgewater. And as many of you know, Chair Lady Cronin took on one of probably the toughest roles um, in, the, in the legislature, especially this year, as we're taking a look at criminal justice uh, reform and to modernize our criminal justice system. And I'd have to say she's done an absolutely incredible job. It's very difficult to, to explain how, how uh, complicated and nu nuanced that subject is. The House's comprehensive approach, I think, represents meaningful, workable, sustainable changes that will make our criminal justice more, system more equitable. At the time of the passage, by the way, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court called Chair Lady Cronin's work a reform plan for the real world. And as a member of my leadership team, her contributions to the House of Representatives have been immeasurable. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. But in addition to that, I'd be remiss if I didn't also say what a, a great a champion she is for her uh, district. I use the word champion. I guess, is Brockton still the city of champions? Because I got yelled at when I went to Everett, by the way. They say they are the city of champions. And so, on. so I just want to make sure I've got that, that clear. But whether it's supporting veterans, students, economic development, or social issues like combating addiction, uh, Chair Lady Cronin always puts her constituents first. And it's also my pleasure, really, to have um, some of my colleagues here uh, today um, as well. And I sincerely want to thank them. As was mentioned earlier by the previous speakers, uh, you are very fortunate in this region to have such dedicated state representatives and, and senators um, as well. Uh, so I sincerely want to thank who I see here today, Representative Cassidy, Representative Dubois, uh, Senator Mike Brady. Even though he's a senator, he's a still a good guy as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he was always a good friend and still a friend to me. Um, uh, and I want to thank them, and Representative D'Amelio called me 17 times to tell me that he couldn't be here uh, today, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being here as well. To Chris Cooney, Cooney in, the, uh, in the chamber, uh, Chair Doe, uh, thank you for hosting me here uh, uh, today as well. During my time as Speaker, I'd have to say that we have tried to put a premium on building strong working relationships with local and regional groups. While I look forward to the annual address that I give at the Boston Chamber of Commerce each year, which I recently uh, did this past Friday, uh, where I sort of outline what we're going to be talking about in this year's session, I'd have to say that it's the regional meetings with the chambers that I find to be most valuable. Massachusetts is fortunate 
to have such a diverse economy that mirrors the spirit of our great state. By meeting with regional chambers in your hometowns, I am able to learn what drives the economy, but may go overlooked sometimes by the media. I can't begin to tell you how these meetings uh, inform our work that we do up on Beacon Hill. Your work has been crucial to Massachusetts distinguishing itself as an economic powerhouse. And I am proud to say that our efforts together are bearing fruit. Earlier this year, we learned that not only is Massachusetts the most educated state in the nation, but our, but our workers are earning more and are more likely to obtain stable, fulfilling jobs. In 2017, the state's gross domestic product has grown by more than 4% compared to the national average of 2.6%. Last month, our unemployment rate dropped yet again. We again remain well under the national average. The House's work in conjunction with people such as you here today has helped us climb out of the recession to ignite an upward economic trajectory. Earlier this month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released a report showing more than just steady economic growth. Employers are not only filling jobs from within the workforce, they are now hiring people who are unemployed, underemployed, or just entering the workforce. This shift in hiring trends means that we need to equip our students with tools to gain a competitive edge, as was mentioned earlier. And I'm not only talking about job creation. Of course, that's a huge part of the equation. But I'm also speaking about partnering with institutions of higher education, workforce training programs, and education nonprofits. I only say that weaving together diverse sectors of our economy together and supporting workers of all skill sets is crucial to Massachusetts' continued success and national leadership. One of our biggest focuses has been on integrating education and business. The House has made meaningful investments to bolster this strategy. And I'd like to mention, as was mentioned earlier by the president of Master Sawyer, the STEM Starter Academy, an initiative that provides community college students with pathways to jobs in high growth fields. In its short tenure, STEM Starter has garnered the interest of Genzyme and Microsoft, which have formed talent pipeline partnerships with our community colleges. And I'd also again like to recognize Massasoit Community College for its participation, as was mentioned earlier in the STEM Starter uh, program. I've had the chance to meet with some of your students at community college. I saw their research firsthand and heard about their dreams and plans as they advance their education and their careers. I know we have a few educators and administrators from Master Sawyer here today in addition to the president, and I want to thank them as well for their work. We also understand the nexus between our growing life sciences sector, education, and the strength of the overall economy. That's why we will reinvigorate our commitment to the life sciences industry this session by supporting innovators and in industries at the forefront of the scientific and technological breakthroughs. I think as President Clark had mentioned a little bit earlier. Our original investment in life sciences has had significant input on our institutions of higher education. Therefore, we are going to remain focused on how we can integrate 
our public higher ed and life sciences sectors. A renewed injection of funding is critical to maintaining the Commonwealth's competitive edge, promoting advanced manufacturing, and developing a productive workforce. We will be proud this session to support the students, researchers, dreamers, and doers who are making Massachusetts and the world a better place to live. I also want to, you to know that we are acutely aware of the concerns with local K through 12 funding. And if I didn't know that, I learned it very quickly here today. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> Last year, Chapter 70 school funding totaled more than $4.7 billion, which I'd like to tell you is a high in terms of historic high for what we had in Massachusetts. The FY18 investment reflects an increase of more than $106 million over the previous fiscal year. I know that many of you have expressed concern in the foundation budget formula. Last year, we took a decisive step to addressing concerns identified by the Foundation Budget Review Commission by allocating $26.3 million toward adjusting health care rates. As a representative of Revere, I stand in the same position, I think, as, as was mentioned by the Mayor of Brockton a little bit earlier. I understand the challenges that our cities are facing when it comes to education educating a diverse student population. And I recognize that schools need help ensuring that all students succeed in the classroom. Oftentimes, that means supporting them beyond traditional academia. These are our issues, these are issues, I should say, that our schools need help with addressing, including children's behavioral health, mental health, and trauma. That's why the House created the Safe and Supportive School Commission. We're taking steps to support school districts as they work with community partners in order to create an inclusive, whole school learning environment. The House will continue to facilitate these important partnerships, and I look forward to hearing from folks in cities like Brockton as to how we can help support school districts in these efforts. In keeping with these efforts, to ensure that our youngest and most vulnerable children are prepared to succeed, the House has championed unprecedented increases in early education funding by, by targeting funding to support the early education and care workforce in early childhood mental health consultation services. I know that many businesses and residents are concerned about the growing cost of health care. We are hard at work on the health care bill, and I'd li like to outline some of the highlights as the legislation takes shape. In the coming months, we will be taking up the PETA v. Cocott health care bill, named after our former colleague and chair of the Health Care Financing Committee, to, ex to enhance access to high quality health care, affordable health care, while maximizing the impact of our existing infrastructure. Perhaps most importantly, the legislation will make our health care system work better for all residents of the Commonwealth, particularly the most vulnerable amongst us. It will increase transparency, empower small businesses, and lay the groundwork for mass health reforms. I want to thank the businesses and the organizations here today that have brought creativity and practical ideas to the health care discussion. We are all well aware of the distinct challenges that each of you face, as well as the invaluable contributions you make to our economy and the social fabric of the Commonwealth. With that, 
I just want to outline a couple of the details of the Peter Cocott bill. We've heard directly from business that increased transparency allows people to make better and more informed health care decisions. This means giving health care consumers more information about their options in an easily digestible way. No one doubts that negotiating insurance offerings can be very, very complicated, especially for tiered and limited network products that seek to lower costs, but also put a greater burden on the consumer. Standardizing how hospital and service tiers are presented will make it easier for employers and consumers to understand their options and make savvier, more cost-effective decisions. Therefore, our bill will require a uniform methodology to communicate the tiering of providers and also certain health care services across all health care plans. This legislation will also require delineation between each plan and cost-sharing requirement and explain how quality will impact each tier assignment. And when a patient can't stay in that network, there will be new consumer protections for out-of-network billing. We will take the patient out of the middle and make cost differences between in-network and out-of-network costs more comprehensible. We will also pave the way for future reforms to mass health by requiring increased transparency and reporting. This legislation will require the Assistant Secretary for Mass Health to provide testimony at HPC's annual cost trends hearing. With this detailed information, we will have a more complete picture of cost drivers as we seek to move this towards a more integrated and effective delivery system. I understand that this particular region of our Commonwealth has particular concerns about your health care landscape in local hospitals. And I look forward to dis further discussions relative to this bill as it moves through the committee process. I also want to recognize Sue Joss, community health centers are a lifeline for many of our neighborhoods. And Sue, I want to thank you for that. In driving to this event and speaking to Chairwoman Cronin last week, I was reminded how economic development is really a regional effort. Cities and towns don't exist in a bubble. The revitalization of Easton's historic district has, has an impact outside of Easton. As downtown Brockton continues its revitalization, especially with the news of a new parking garage, I wholly expect surrounding areas will experience benefits of the new, developing, new developers coming into this part of the state. And one of the messages that I want to leave you here with here today is that I look at ourselves as a commonwealth, a true commonwealth. It's not just about Boston and in, in, in Cambridge or the greater Boston area. It's about what we're trying to do throughout the commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's been one of the messages that I've tried to deliver and talk about as I crisscross this state. And that's why one of the items that I had set up has been the Bay State Business Link. We're, in, we're making every effort that we can, an initiative started by the House, to try to make sure that we try to link businesses from one part of the state to the other part of the state. One of the things that I have learned is the fact that sometimes businesses, will say in the Boston or the Cambridge area, look elsewhere, out of state, and sometimes out of the country, to do businesses to do business with, you know, with, with, with someone else outside of our particular reason, not realizing that they could get the same goods or product right here within Massachusetts. 
And that's something right now that I'm working on with Chamber of Commerce throughout the, the state to, to try to bring to fruition so that Massachusetts businesses through the Bay, Bay State Business Link will work with each other to increase economic development, and increase jobs right here in Massachusetts. And with that, I sincerely want to thank you. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of your own businesses and organizations, on behalf of the, the Chamber, and on behalf of the overall region. <laughs>